let me start. This is not going to be very long. I'm going to present two papers because 2018, 2019, I went to, well, in 2018, I went to a conference in Jeju here, and they asked me to chair humanitarian technologies uh, session that was IEEE. And if you don't know who is IEEE, hello. It's Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. So it's a big organization, and their motto is Advancing Technology for Benefit of Humanity. So there was a big conference there in Jeju. They asked me to share humanitarian technologies. I did that. And then, meanwhile, there was another conference that is associated with IEEE, but it's a different one um, that's in Tanzania now in May that I'm going to go to. And then there is one in October that we're submitting another version of the paper. That's again, Humanitarian uh, Technology Conference associated with IEEE. So I combine in this talk two presentations. One is a major one, the one you titled, and then I'm going to give you a smaller version of the one that I did with Fakina. The second one is gonna be more of a discussion, like around table. It will be less like presenting your results because it's a, an um, emerging topic. So um, then I looked up last night, uh, what do we mean by humanitarian technologies, right? So it's- Suzanne, yeah. could I ask you to, just I've wondered about this for a long time. What exactly is the distinction electrical and electronic engineering. I thought they were mostly uh, interchangeable. That's a good question, I don't know. I mean, electrical is generally more It's an I mean, interesting question coming from you. Well, <laughs> this is basically I mean, about what I what I'd like to know. I, I can dig into this, but is if that if they use both just to cover all. Well, the, in University of Colorado, they add computer and energy engineering, so the name is growing. It's called electrical computer and energy engineering. So I think they dropped electronics and they add, add, added computer and energy. So I think it's a very important thing. Anyway, so let's talk about communitarian technologies. There is nothing, there's not, not a set list what's a communitarian technology, but this is what I found by looking at different papers and projects that have been involved, and that one I chaired and the one I heard about. Natural and man-made disasters. Problems of, so we had a person in Jeju who was from Red Cross doing, designing, uh, toilets, they don't need water in case the, the, the whole infrastructure is destroyed. So things like that during earthquakes and stuff. Then the one I did was assistive technology for disabled and now they're starting to call them differently able. Because disabled it implies a negative connotation and this is a, they're trying to be more politically correct. correct. So they call them differently able. And in a sense, that's appropriate because person who doesn't see has a better hearing than person who has all the thing, uh, has all senses. So it's quite fitting. And then a humanitarian crisis or refugees, and that's their conference is coming up in Tanzania. We have a session on refugee, and I see we have questions in there. Then vulnerable population, which can be anywhere, any country, right? Any population at risk that actually has no resources. That's how they define. Extreme poverty, so it's not like really centered on developing countries per se, because you can have extreme poverty in slums in big and developing countries. And then this is what I found last night, which I didn't wasn't even aware, and that might be interesting tomorrow, challenges for rural communities environmental degradation.
migration and young people migration. Mm -hmm. So it was included one project of humanitarian technology schools in the Middle East. Interesting. The, the larger phrase, our master program here now, mobile technologies and disaster risk reduction. So yeah. that's the whole So maybe concept. that can go under that. But mm -hmm. I was just looking up, I was Googling what it means to the technologies and these are kind of projects we had. So my project is that we presented, it's an ongoing project, and there's two students here who are actually involved in it in that 441 project that I do a small piece of it. Or hopefully, actually, if everything works out, it will be a big piece. Um, it's called Redesigning Mobility Aid to Function in Challenging Environments and Low Resource Setups, or Limited Resource Setups. So this was the conference. Unfortunately, or fortunately, in this presentation, I combined the past results and the future results because it's, or soon to be presented results. So I kind of comprised them in, in one presentation. And uh, this was research that I did with Professor Bayeris, who was a mechanical engineer here. He meanwhile left and went to Greece, and we continue working with that. There was a mechanical engineering student, and there was one of our students at the time. So let's talk about this. So disabled population, I still call them disabled. It's pretty soon I have to change that. So we looked up some data by World Health Organization data, 15% um, of the world population, which is about 1 billion people, right, has, has some kind of form of disability. Any form of disability that they, they have identified in test. So wearing glasses actually is considered disability. It's actually one of the more common disabilities. Um, then we find out with this young man help us that 50% of them have disability that's related to mobility. So they cannot walk, climb, move without some help. That's a half of the disabled people. But we were more interested in people who, so most of disability research was on wheelchairs, mobility disability research, right? But in, in in poor environments or limited resources, that might not work. And actually in the past, there was a problem with application. So we found a number that about 20 million people need a low end device because they, have, they don't have income to afford a wheelchair and they have obstacles to getting one. So we thought how we can approach this problem. So what we did is we proposed an improvement on a low-end device, such as crutch or cane, that can be used in challenging environments. So let me define for you what we consider challenging environments and how we tested it. So the challenging environments are environments have, that have not cohesive ground. That means particles can move. So walking on sand or loose ground, right? Also soft ground, like grass, and um, uneven terrain. So even walking with crutches, case might be problematic going for a walk on unpaved path, right? Now, in developing countries, and I have a picture here, if you can see, is that kind of ground is everywhere, right? Even here, somewhere. So crutches are really designed for perfectly flat, dry, no obstacles ground. So this is the bottom of the crutch. That's how it looks. So what we did is we actually said, well, let's just take this bottom, the, the, we call it the shoe of the crutch, and we designed that, not the whole thing, right? Because what we are trying to do is keep the cost comparable to the existing one, and that, that bottom cost about $2 at the moment. And the crutches are pretty inexpensive and lots of people around the world do have them. So what we make, made it is we made it compatible with existing crutch so you can actually replace it without throwing away the existing equipment. So why did we pick crutches? Um, 
based on the Egyptian carvings, the Karch has been around for about 5,000 years. Just imagine, you know, you hurt your leg, there is a piece of wood, a stick, you put it underneath and it helps you walk. Now, the funny thing is it hasn't changed much. It's really more or less the same design. So this is how the modern Karch looks. 5,000 years, no improvement. That's kind of shocking to us. <coughs> um, so then we had the collaborators from mechanical engineering and they told us the most important aspect of the culture came for them. Now, there is a comfort issue, the thing that connects with your body, that's a different issue to attack. But for us now, we wanted to look at how it engages with the ground. So this whole research so far has been done on a simulated device, right? They were doing it in a computer simulation, how the crutch um, connects with the ground. So what we proposed is something, and this was my idea, and one of the things, and Mark knows that when we did that last year, is who is the best equipped to walk on these devices and that intervals? So, I was thinking the duck, right? Duck can walk. I mean, many animals do, right? <laughs> Bears do, and we had different ideas. So we said, okay, what about if we take this design idea from nature, right? And animals and look at the duck. So, we proposed, okay, I told you that, that we wanted to still keep it um, compatible with the existing one and make it with the same material. <laughs> so the design, the computer design that they, um, um, they the pet design that they did is they did conical outer shape. I have some better pictures. This one's hard to see, which is larger on the outside and it had to increase the surface, but the bottom area they experimented with four or five contact supports. So they would have four or five contact supports in between will be soft. So, and the reason is I think duck has that because you have to push on the ground, right? And the soft part is the part that accommodates the surface. So we were trying to reproduce that. Um, and we wanted to increase the surface and deformation. Now I'm gonna tell you some mechanical engineer terms and uh, please don't ask me what they mean. They trained me to tell them and, and explain them. So if you have, you can address this question to my mechanical engineer collaborators. We have another one now in Greece. So we wanted to mimic duck foot and we wanted to accommodate some kind of stones and rocks and be able to walk on soft ground and wet ground. So before they did that, they looked at the existing design. Uh, no, actually, that's in a different slide, sorry. So um, this, this is showing how they actually modeled it. They did 3D models of conventional crutch first and they compare it with the proposed design. So first, um, when they were here, they used, Ali, what did they use here? Creo 5. No, Creo 5 is the one they're using in Greece. They use something else. You're talking about the software? Yeah. Okay. A different software. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so they used a different software, and now we're using Creo 5, which is a professional version, because the first design started with a student here doing her 499 project in mechanical engineering, uh, what she did. And then they looked at the models, and they looked how they contact the terrain. Now the way they designed it is the, the pressure that's applied, they thought, they looked at the typical female weight are about 64 kilos, and they assume that you uh, distribute the weight evenly, so if one foot, the leg is hurting, then then the, 
the half of the weight goes on the one leg, that's okay, and the other half is distributed on two crutches. So they basically look at the surface of that, the load that's one quarter of the weight. Does that make sense? That was their assumption, and I don't know what they based that on. But the assumption is that you would still keep half a weight on the leg that's okay, and the other half gets spread on the crutches. So leg, ta leg takes a half a load, and the other half between crutches. So they looked at the weight of one foot. They did numerical anal analysis using statical linear elastic problem, and they calculated the bone misty stresses, which is the way you measure stress, or the pressure. Think about it as the pressure uh, on the ground. None of this, don't ask me about what this means. They did something with electrical engineering, how to measure pressure on the ground. I know more about it. Okay, so this is the existing one. Commercial crutch shoe apparently deforms elastically under pressure, each evenly, right? And that the stress is somewhere between 95 and 105 kilopascals, which is 15 times, and I, we have a table comparing it, 15 times more than a human foot. But I mean, imagine it's a smaller surface, right? And it's hard. So it's not, it's not surprising. And then there is this issue about the hole. There is a hole in the middle, and that hole is supposed to drain moisture. And apparently there is a stress concentration on that hole, which increases the stress flow. So this is one alternative design and idea. They have actually five contact areas. They started with four and then they went up to five. I compared the pictures between these two. And um, now the, the good thing about this is because it's a soft, um, so there's only five contact areas and between is the soft elastic thing that they took away the stress from the hole because the hole doesn't interface with the ground anymore, right, the middle of it. And um, they calculated the stress is now 13 kilopascals. Here was a bit uh, close to 100 and here is 13. Uh, where is it? So here, let me jump to this one. This is a comparison with the human foot. So the human foot is about 6.3. The proposed design is 13 and conventional, actually they said it should be really 100, not 300. Still, we're about twice, with one simple adjustment, we made the pressure considerably lower. From 6 to 13, yes, it's twice as big, but not 10 times. Okay, so then they did, okay, I did this one. Then they assessed design, how it performs at uneven surfaces. Um, so it comes up that they can accommodate, with this proposed design, we can accommodate small rocks up to 20 millimeters in height because that's the dome of that soft area on the rigid surface. So they can fit under the crutch and keep the stability. Because the current crutch, yeah? Sorry, are you going to get this right? Oh, you can. The current crutch, actually, if there's even a tiny rock, you become unstable. Yeah. Oh. Is there any reason why you decided to have five contact points? Uh, that's what they were experimenting. We started with four. The first design, the, when I was putting pictures up, the first design had four, because if you remember, the duck's foot has four, right? But the duck's foot is one, two, three, four, right? Now we have five fingers and five, but the duck's foot is pointing forward and we want it to be uh, circular, right? Because it's, duck knows where they're going and with the crutch then you will have to worry about where it is going. So this is just really computationally came up to be a better design, experimental. So you're saying other angles of six, seven were or were not tested, or no? So oh. we look. Up, we started with four because we were mimicking the dark foot. Mm -hmm. Now, 
it's possible that 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 can that, that we can experiment with that. At this point, we're not comparing one design to the other. We're comparing our design to an instrument, to a traditional instrument. That can go on. Actually, our next next step is to more do what they were interested in, to make a prototype and compare it in the real world. That's an amazingly reduction of the huge yeah, pressure. Yeah, with a really simple engineering solution. And you can see, so it's quite, 20, um, 20, 20 millimeters is not much, but comparing to zero on all accommodation, that's an improvement. And then we looked at the cost, and it turns out that the volume is about the same, so we're assuming the cost will be equal if we do injection molding. Now, 3D printing, the cost might be different, but I don't know, I mean, 3D printing is for a prototype, okay, but if you're gonna do it, um, hmm? mass, yeah, it will be cheaper. So the cost will not increase. So, so this is the one that I, that I showed you before. Human foot, conventional crutch, and foot post design. So it's much closer to the same thing. And then, oops, I have to take the Then this is how, so apparently from a proper mechanical engineering perspective, you look actually the formation of the ground. So this is the part I understood. How much ground deforms and how much it, de how it, it uh, deforms when you press on it. So if it reforms a lot, that's bad, especially if it's soft. And if it doesn't, that's actually better for stability. So they looked at the deformation of the ground and they have pictures of that. Um, for the standard crutch is uniform on the whole bottom and the crutch was sinking into a soft one that they tested. And I'm sure a different material will be a different sinking, but about 8.75 millimeters. Well, alternately crutch because of the soft, uh, this contact point and the distribution of the load will go only 2.5. So this is a little table that compares the cost sinking and uh, how much, um, how many, the size of abnormalities that can um, accommodate. So this is the visualization, this is cool. So the red thing is bad because there is more pressure. So this is the, the commercial crutch and this is the one we did kind of. So the lower color, I mean, less heat colors and less Then we move into our side, which Ali was involved, and we looked at expensive social income, and we looked at two, the individual and the community and the country itself. So this was the contribution of our students. Do you want to talk about this? No? <laughs> um, so um, the expected, expected social income impact for the individual is to improve mobility, health, and quality for disabled. We're talking about poor people. Are they developed countries or developing countries? Developed or developing. So mobility, health, and quality of life. Promote functional independence. They, they can move out. I mean, there's lots of research being done about wheelchairs and people who have no wheelchairs and they get the wheelchair and get out of their house and they actually their life improves, right, considerably because they're housebound. So here's some pictures here of the um, young people um, in poor environments that are using it. And then there is a cost for um, disability, right? The cost of disability for the individual and their family that, that could be reduced. And, but the important one, it was interesting to me from the economics perspective is how much that can increase the output or the income of these people and that will give them an access to labor market. If they actually can easier move and leave their house and go and get a job and go to work. Um, then for children going to school, improve their learning. 
There was one study done that there's actually high correlation between mobility disability and learning disabilities. But I think it's mm. not that, they, they're not that independent, right? They're the ones that, um, the two ones I found, that the one that people who have mobility issues actually don't even get into school and get exposed to learning. So I don't know if, and there is a correlation, I don't know more than that. And then social inclusion. So this is all for the individual. The part that was a little more interesting to me. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I think you have covered this, but uh -huh. uh, I have sure. a couple of very elementary questions, but yes, it's completely fundamental. How are those two first impacts obtained uh, compared to the uh, conventional uh, crutches? Yeah. How, in what sense mobility is improved, for example, and how is functional independence promoted? Yeah. So uh, just 80% of the, all disabled people live in developing countries. Mm -hmm. That's what we should have started with. Um, but the assistive technology industry is very specialized and limited, typically focusing on high income products. So it's a matter that they don't have, and the other finding is that 75% of all assistive technologies are abandoned. The reason for that is that their needs are not being addressed on any level. Crutches have never been really redesigned since 100 years. The reason we chose the crutch, the whole point was that 80% of all disabled people don't have the means necessary to have access to assistive technologies because of the cost. The cost is prohibitive. And the other thing is, even if they do uh, cure the traditional assistive technologies, they're not designed for their environment. Uh, a wheelchair or the traditional cane is not prepared to be used on uneven terrain as such that is common in uh, refugee camps, shantytown, rural villages, the areas that are things that are common in developing countries. So this was how can we uh, redesign some of the most rudimentary, um, cheapest um, assistive technologies in a way that can solve that problem. So we started with that problem. That was the whole motivation. So it's not we're not arguing that this improves mobility and the traditional cane doesn't improve mobility. We're saying that we're de redesigning the traditional cane to fit the specific needs of these populations. And that specific need that this you need to do is to overcome the yes, work on the uneven terrain. Yes, and support yes. so to be cheap. So we didn't go to a wheelchair. We started with the, we went to so the So that's the part of the restricted value. So thank you for answering. Uh, we assume that um, they will be more mobile and they will be moving better if they, if, if the environment they live in and work in is actually uneven and hard to move through. And the, the cost will be not that high. So our initial idea was that actually we begins send it to Bangladesh and, and, and have an NGO purchase and, and distribute it to refugees there. That was one. So this part was inferred how much it can influence the national output. And I would actually value feedback on that because we looked at people studying and people that study that are mostly from the World Bank and UN. They looked at um, exclusion of disabled people to the contribution of GDP. So our, our statement is that we'll decrease poverty by giving them an option to go and get a job that will expand the pool of working age population so if they're stuck in the home and couldn't go out that they actually can have access uh, or at least have ability to go and look for a job we're not claiming they're going to find it but at least they will have a chance when they leave their home right and then um, um, disabled people are especially in developing countries, one of the poorest people in there, right? Because in developed countries, at least they will have, um, I, I inquired, then in, in Korea, government provides wheelchairs to people who cannot move, right? In, in, in developing countries, that, that's, that's not the case. I mean, it's prohibitive, so they really actually have no access to employment and it's a, um, in the 
extreme poverty. And then, interestingly enough, and I have there, we found out that people from the World Bank and other organization um, calculated the impact of disability and how much it reduces the GDP around the world. So here is my next slide. And we found three so far major studies. One, in 2009, this person, Baku, calculated his, his um, study is called the price of exclusion, the economic consequences of excluding people from disability from the world of work. And he will estimate it down. You have to look at a specific country because of their employment rates and their wages. So he looked at specific countries, There's and most of them were developing countries. And the percentages that he presented are between three and 5%. So GDP is lower on the order of three five 5% because disabled people are excluded from contribution. And considering that what numbers Ali was telling you that it's a larger percentage of population. So more or less, the, <coughs> they will, <coughs> A small investment in this will bring them a large return. Then I found something, some, another set of researchers that very recently looked at 188 countries and they looked at GDP loss from injuries. Now, crutches are not only used for permanently disabled people, but also people who fall down. And <laughs> I lived for two years in Rwanda and there is very, my opportunity to fall down and break a leg was huge. <laughs> I mean, there is liability insurance there would be enormous because of the way it's really the, the, the safety of the environment. There would be a manhole that were just covered with cardboard that you can fall in and break or injured. So again, this proportional percentage of develop, developing countries have injured. And so his number is somewhere around 6.4% loss of in, from injuries for the GDP. And then <coughs> we were trying to put a number on it and we decided against it finally. But the only thing we can claim is that um, the population, so this is the, all the disabilities, right? But we learned in the beginning that 50% of the population with disability has mobility disability. So you would say, okay, so only half of that. Except that we're really looking on the labor income aspect or the, in, um, the labor contribution to GDP. So it doesn't influence the capital, doesn't influence the, all the other transactions, other parts that come in the GDP. So we really should look at the labor portion of GDP and that is about 50% of GDP. So our point is that, yeah, maybe half of this we can contribute, but we can contribute much more um, to the labor portion of GDP, right? So if this is half and this is half, they kind of cancel each other. We did not, so we found this uh, measuring labor share in developing countries so we did not put a number on it yet. We're just presenting all the evidence. It's really hard to put a number because all of these are large studies. They looked at many, many countries. It differs from country to country. So that's therefore the range between three to five. But uh, this is just the background telling you that impact can be actually quite substantial. In the countries that might need the most. So, in conclusion to this, this paper is the proposed design can easily replace the current clutch, crutch with those special tools. You actually, I have a traditional crutch. You can unwind um, it from the bottom and replace it. The new, so our specifications are made so it, it fits that. It uh, reduces the pressure on the terrain, much, much more closer to the human foot. And then it removes concentrations, uh, stress concentration effects of the draining hole. Uh, 
it will be um, it would sink much less than a traditional trench, right? It would be 2.5 as opposed to 8.75, and it can accommodate stones up to 20 meters. And the final cost will be about the same, which considerable individual and society. Does this proposed innovation mm -hmm. bring mobility to a larger number of the uh, mobility handicapped people, or does it just provide greater convenience in terms of? Uh, well, around? if they can, if they have a, if, if with a standard crash they cannot walk because the 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 area where they live or work is not. They're not able to use it because it's uneven, soft, wet, or whatever. They has rough. Then we're actually giving them a new tool because so the traditional the, one doesn't work. What is the estimated uh, the size of beneficiary population in that regard? What's the additional size of people who would be able to move around with this technology while they couldn't with the old technology? Well, good question. Hmm? Yeah, I have the same question. Well, yeah. it's anybody, I mean, we're giving you an uh, upper bound, right? Yeah. We don't know who is gonna adopt it mm -hmm. and how easy it is to distribute it and who is gonna pay for it. But the upper bound for that is that um, the developing countries have how many people, 80 million people who need um, a mobility device how many of them are, are gonna be able to get it or not, right? And then, so that's an upper bound, right? A lower bound is zero. And then, um, depending on a country, it will be anywhere between, so the disability cost country between three to five, but mobility disability is half of that, right? So it will be somewhere, let's say, Two percent, two and a half percent, two and a half percent of GDP, on average, is considerable, right? So, like the total demographic would be two hundred fifty million people. That's the one billion people uh, with disabilities. Eighty percent of them live in developing countries. Seventy-five percent of them abandon the assistive technologies that they acquire. So, we're looking at people who bought, who purchased, uh, or were seeking some you know, crush or something. And then they, they found it that it's not fitting to their environment, they can't use it. So that's what we're targeting. We don't know what percentage would accept it or, or not accept it, but that's the target audience. Actually, the uh, situation that I can e easily imagine mm -hmm. is that regardless of what kind of a country you are from, mm -hmm. you, for sometimes you, mo you move around on flat surface, mm -hmm. and then in some circumstances, uh, depending on where you are going, you will have to walk over uneven terrains so that actually everyone yeah. is a potential beneficiary depending on the uh, circumstances. Yes, we even found out that, that um, um, the people in wheelchairs sometimes have to get up exactly. and do this last few steps um, on a crutches or any other support. So yeah, it is, we're just, this is geared towards just developing countries, but you know, when we did that proposal with Mark last, last January, we looked actually at how many people here in Korea are on a low income, and yes, Korean government does provide wheelchairs, but they're not that applicable for uneven terrain, sand, grass, versus of grass, nothing would be an uninformed opinion that I have mm -hmm. on this issue is probably the more relevant question is what percentage of time the, uh, the mobility handicapped people in wherever they are will have to overcome the challenge of uh, moving over uneven surfaces in their daily living. Mm -hmm. But we were more concerned here about um, going to work. If they're not able to go to to whatever they do. Now, of course, they cannot be lifting heavy equipment, uh, I mean, anything, doing physically, but
but they can go and do some kind of job. So it will be improve their ability to apply for jobs. Yes. Is there any correlation between disabilities and education? Yes. Yes. <laughs> They're doing that yeah. part. I imagine there. there's a lot of variables, but up or yes. Down. Um, well, I told you that um, another member of their group found uh, last year that uh, last year that there is a high correlation between mobility and learning um, learning uh, disability. And I don't know if that means that they cannot go to school, or is that just intrinsically correlated? So yeah. The more relevant question. Sure. So when, when when will this thing come to the market? Are you um, we're doing a prototype or? right now, and um, we are uh, we need to test it in the real world. This is all done in software so far. For example, you can talk to the Korean government and offer them this technology so that we they wrote a proposal. We did, yeah, but they weren't interested. We're, they we're what? too we get we're too we again maybe for they the were not K, interested. No, the yeah, National Science Foundation were not. Korean. Yeah. Oh yeah. And what was the response? No. But we didn't have or actually have you any talk feedback. to the uh, civil society organizations who speak for those <coughs> people. How? We have a lot of uh, CSO organizations. We had a doctor associated with our team at Seoul National University. Yeah, she was a nurse. Yeah, doctor, okay, okay. Doctor. <coughs> a nurse practitioner, but once the the Korean National Science Foundation grant did not go through, our collaboration with her broke up. We had one collaborator who worked for um, rehabilitation service, mm -hmm. and he was a he designer. Unfortunately, too. didn't have a PhD, so we couldn't put mm -hmm. him on a grant. Which is unfortunate because he does actually he does um, rehabilitation of people. But you guys have PhD, so why? Uh... Well, we wrote the proposal, and they didn't even. Give they it. want everybody to have a PhD. I mean, it's the structure that's hard to. Well, I think the larger point I think we can take from this is they want a certain kind of grant exclusively, and they rank it. I imagine on everybody having a PhD, and that ranks higher in the the scoring of how you get that. So if two people didn't have a PhD, it's assumed that these people have not enough working skill or knowledge, but nonetheless, in this case, we added those people because they had more working skill. So the current, you know, K- They have the practical skill. Yeah, they had the practical skill that was necessary to make it work. They had the sites where we would actually test it, but the way the polarized uh, grant analysis was we interesting. That. Well, you, interesting you, you, Professor Lester, you know we worked on the, the NRF proposal, that was it. Okay. Yeah, in our efforts. Personally, I will make efforts to find an appropriate counterpart, the Korean Thank one. To you. Thank you. Please, that would be great. That would be great. <laughs> er, yeah. It seems to be a very easy. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I want to say. It's a, like a small, easy modification of an existing yeah. device that everybody's familiar, comfortable. They know how to use it. You don't have to train them, and it can make a huge difference. And all I did is think of a duck. It would be very interesting innovation. Well, okay. So speaking of innovation, this was um, this was all done um, between us and um, so me and my student and Professor Mechanica Junior, the student, and we had completely different backgrounds. And um, I'm doing my pitch for diversity <laughs> everywhere I go. We had completely different backgrounds, different experiences, and there was lots of brainstorming. Mm -hmm. there and we came up with a solution we also considered barefoot the way bears walk but we stayed with the mm -hmm. duck because mm -hmm. we spoke with people who use currently crutches and they told us that even a little bit of rain like two days is a big issue by the way you listed a number of uh, cases uh, which would uh, uh, be classified as uh, humanitarian mm -hmm. problems all of them together remind me of the, the most important theme of these six, 17 UN SDGs, which is do not leave anyone behind. So this technology. Yeah, what they go under. Yeah. Okay, how much time do we have? It's been only 46 minutes. But. Okay, so I want to talk for just a few minutes about the last one, the, the second paper. Um, this one is a little different. 
This one was more an academic study about refugees and ICTs. Okay, so ICTs everywhere, and refugees are known to leave their home with nothing else except their phones, right? Now, getting a SIM card and being incorporated into the new society is one of their goals, right? And when they, when they change um, their um, lives, better this, usually they leave their homes because they're poor. Nobody lives. But it's incorrectly assumed that they're poor. A lot of refugees are not poor. They're leaving because they feel unsafe. Okay, so this research was key trends and gaps in peer reviewed scholarship. So we looked at do researchers actually study this at all? So this was like a meta study that my students should know about. So we looked at, at the different existing studies. So this is gonna be presented at a round table discussing um, the research about refugees and technology. So what we found is a significant portion of the studies is about the initial cases and exploratory research. So nobody has gone deeper into looking at refugees and ICT. And it's disproportionate about lifestyle adaptability of different options. Majority of them comes from there. And, and, oops. and then in the sectors like education, healthcare, and communication for refugees, the studies are usually primarily on supply side, what we can offer, as opposed to demand side, what the refugees actually want. Right? So nobody included refugees in their studies. So this is the um, conference that I'm going in Tanzania and it's done again with Ali and uh, Hakim Hussein, who was the professor, and who is now primarily doing research on refugees. Okay, so what was our methodology? We searched existing literature. We used Google Scholar, Web of Science, and IEEE, just because it's a uh, database. And the, the, the terms of search were refugees, displaced population, and ICT application. Now, displaced population is a larger term than refugees, right? Um, refugees have to acquire status by UN to be in that category, and displaced population can be actually internal or external, so moving within a country. But we, we, we were indiscriminatory and looked at that. So, we found 35 research studies that had both either displaced population and ICT applications or refugees and ICT applications. And it's surprisingly uh, very few were high quality scientific papers. So it's a really a gap that, that needs to be filled pretty fast. So what are the existing themes on that that we found? Using ICT tools in assessment on refugee condition and status. So a lot of studies looked at existing camps and how they can, um, how refugees are using ICT there. There is one study about <coughs> local network service quality and the service delivery and one about designing refugee camps. There was one that actually kind of triggered me that found that there is inequality um, uh, in access to a cellular service in, within a camp. That UN personnel uses one cell tower and uh, all the other refugees use a different one. And that inequality was, I don't know if it's on purpose or it happened, but the, the, quality, of the, the quality of the service was very different. Um, another one that um, had some study in it was ICT tools for education in refugees. Actually, I did one of, of these studies earlier in my career, a couple of years ago, looking at um, university in a refugee camp in Rwanda. It's the studies we found right now was about marginalized children and youth and how they use ICT tools for their education. 
and then identifying uh, barriers to enforcement, how you can use ICT tools to find out about the enforcement. And then there was another set of uh, things that we identified, three more, empowerment and identity. More or less, these people have interactive life. So how can they find their identity, who they are, who do they belong to, and how do they feel empowered? Uh, what happens to the youth and social inclusions? Now, this is one part, one section that Professor Hussein actually in particular was interested in. He calls it the dark side of ICT. And that is, does ICT put refugees at risk? Are they more traceable because of it? Is it uh, so here is, is their, their privacy at issue? Can they be, I mean, if they are, don't want to be found, if they are fleeing their country, maybe they want to protect their privacy. Then we found some on human trafficking, because refugees are particularly vulnerable population. Okay, so, but surprisingly, again, there is very, they look at ICT tools that are all positive. So one of the papers that I reviewed for this conference in Tanzania looked at undocumented immigrants in the US and their children. So for instance, their children go to the university. Mark, did you read that one? Mm, no, I read know. the one about the global databases and the tracking. No, this was, this was um, interesting to me. They go to college and they are on Facebook or Twitter and they post their pictures there and they could be identified as undocumented residents in US who is currently doing a big um, purge of undocumented. So these are the children of these people who came undocumented in the US. Unfortunately, they were not born here so they didn't acquire citizenship. So they put themselves at risk just by putting their pictures out. It's interesting way to I also think of, you know, if you are an ethnic minority fleeing violence into another country, and if you're required to get UN authorized aid through providing your identity, and the staff of the international agency passes this data internationally, to, I mean, you're, it opens up a huge can of worms at this point. Well, as, as ICT can be beneficial to refugees, it can actually put them at risk. It'll be easier, it'll be tracked. So, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, we're trying to see which, which one dominates. And I think it's the positive part still of, is much more prominent than the negative <coughs> part. But still, I mean, I read another a paper that was here that refugees leaving Mexico leave their phones behind because they don't want to be tracked. And they meet somebody in the US who gives them a brand new phone. <coughs> and then, um, my favorite of all is health, and then health and ICT for refugees. There were quite a few there, but they were looking on primarily in the case study, so pilot study, <coughs> looking at oral health, refugees arriving to Germany, um, education for minors who come without parents, or <coughs> assessing the risk of infections, and then nutritional needs when they arrive. And Professor Hussein was in particularly engaged in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, where education about health issue was a primary mm. concern. There, most of the refugees coming over did not have any uh, vaccination. They were not even aware of the vaccines at all. So the, the country that was accepting them didn't want them exposed, their population, to uh, non-vaccinated. I don't know about that. Current. I'm going to meet him in May in Tanzania. Uh, so we're both going to be. That's the <laughs> current concern in, in, certain in the U.S. They're not coming, they're coming through Mexico, but not from Mexico. So we, we um, have a group that's going to discuss more or less how we can improve the life of refugees because using their ICT technology and at the same time protect their privacy. Let, uh, let me make sure that I understand mm -hmm. the point correctly. 
So about the first one, oral health and so on. You're saying that it's ICT enables assessment of the oral yeah. health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And about the second one, it's about it enabling. Uh, Education and health outcomes of children who come without parents, who, who who are minors in the country. Okay, to, to offer education. So these are all studies that we yeah, identified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the study had to satisfy both, has ICT tools and you're and saying that in regard to, in regard to the second uh, uh, item, the ICT will enable uh, to offer education and the health services for minors. Okay. Yeah. So this is the these are more or less um, they they actually pilot studies on actual implementations, actual implementations. So this one in Germany, they actually studied how they implemented the assessment. Um, then about nutritional and supplements and, and education about nutritional needs. So at the end, um, after we analyzed these 35 studies, we found gaps in the literature and this is um, one, two, three, four, five teams that we proposed should be maybe, uh, because of the importance be a little more represented. Ethics for ICT for refugees. Um, what kind of ethical frame that we should propose and, 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 and implement from the perspective of, of refugees and ICT tools? Uh, there is um, a scarcity of longitudinal studies which is connected to this because in um, development research you um, you com do comparative longitudinal studies to come up with best practices in comparison to see how it could improve. And there is really none done in, in this area. And then this is the king's favorite, and I even know that the word is this, but it's called engendering, meaning paying attention to gender. Uh, it's not endangering, endangering, it's engendering. It's a ye old sociological phrase. Is it? Does yeah, it yeah. really exist? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Hakim didn't invent it. There was another okay. question here from a student. I mean, you might want to catch oh, it now. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering if you, oh, could, I didn't. if you could explain what longitudinal studies is. Longitudinal studies means that you uh, trace the same population, same group um, through time. Okay. So let's say you're going to look at a refugee camp and or a population today, and then you're going to look a year from now and a year from now. And they've been around refugee issues are actually not that decent. They're recently coming to be on the level of humanitarian crisis, right? But they've been around for quite a while. So what you do in studies is what impact did we, let's say, better ICT tools, are we making a difference in their education or finding jobs or inclusion in the society, right? And it's done and over the long period of time. Not long, even if you if you if you follow something for a couple of years, but you actually go in the same location, the same not location, same group of people. And then um, the engendering means that women of all ages are among the most affected groups when it comes to refugees. Very often, women along with children would actually leave the country if the, the father was engaged in the war or killed. So they become more vulnerable. You know, that, that term is uh, problematic because... Really? Yeah, because engender, I just checked a mm -hmm. couple of dictionaries, and engender is a, a term in the, um, in the English language that means to bring something into being. So a government policy uh, engendered conflict between blacks and whites, or that would be one way in which you can, you know, to bring about something. And there's nothing in the dictionary definition about this usage. So um, I have to check with was, Fahim why yeah, you Yeah, I'd like you to check with Fahim. So you know that, that you heard terrible. about that word? I heard engendering or gendering. You can use both. So right. maybe gendering, gendering is... That might, might yeah. be it, but uh, engender is uh, a fairly commonly mm -hmm. used word in the English 
language. I will and it has give nothing, you a message. nothing to do with uh, male Checker. or female or other. Yeah. yeah. I will give him the message. Thank you. I've never heard it before, so no. that's why I was listening to it. But what, what's interesting here is this to conceptualize broadly the role of ICT and refugees. Refugees, by definition, are mobile, transient. Uh -huh. And that may be why there's a lack of longitudinal studies, because in uh, conflict or war caused uh, refugee streams, however these are described, um, once the, the conflict at the sor source stops, then the flow of refugees presumably. Well, also. not in Rwanda. There's refugee camps that are 20 some years old, children born, raised, and grown up in a refugee camp in Rwanda. So that's just why a friend of mine started the university there because these children don't know anything else except being in a refugee camp. In that specific example, but I'm sure you could cite other examples where if there is war and conflict generating a, a stream of refugees, if that conflict, if there's a peace treaty or an agreement, and a good example would be right here in Korea, if the two Koreas could come to an agreement to sort of demilitarize the DMZ and, and denuclearize and so forth, and say that the war is, is behind us now, then the steady stream, it dwindles a little bit, but of refugees from North Korea coming to the South would well, both yeah. have then bigger issues. Then <laughs> <Pardon? laughs> we have bigger, different issues at that point. But um, the, the problem why it's in Rwanda is because the war at DRC has been going on for 20 some years, right? Well, Most anyway, my, my point was simply going to be that the um, refugees, by definition, are mobile, but they're communities of people who require communication. And it's the current mobile communication infrastructures can provide that quickly, cheaply. Um, and, except, you know. except in Africa, you actually have to switch a SIM card. So in one of the, the papers that end up, the UN uh, was handing them SIM cards that they have to switch in their phone. Yeah, but a premise of your research and from talking to Fahim I mean, a surprisingly large number of the people in refugee camps do have mobile phones yeah. and do use them. I know. And it's a and then the some, uh, so the yeah. reason is they want to stay connected to their home. Now the problems now that in the studies I read is when they come to another country, um, uh, looking at the information might be in a different language. That's the other problem. So and then this is my favorite one about entrepreneurship, the refugees. Actually, I've seen lots of studies where they set up shop, to call it, or a little business in a refugee camp. They're actually quite entrepreneurial. It's a survival. So there is a guy who made money in a refugee camp just by repairing people's homes. Right? So that and then this is the one that we found, and it's very there is quite very, very few, and that financial aid to mobile phone transfer. And now with um, blockchain, actually, you can trace that aid that you give to, let's say you want to send to children, refugees, a particular camp, you can trace it and know exactly where it's from. Uh, so the conclusion of this study was that we cannot locate any considerable good quality work in the gender issue, ethics issue, entrepreneurship issue, or what we do in study issues. And our recommendation is that we should be doing more, um, that the board needs to close a little quicker because displacement is on the rise. And now there are waves, right? It goes up and down, but it, at this point it would be and uh, finally, can we just say one more thing and then I'm done? Refugees have to be included in this implementation. Uh, I think Fahim needs, needs to be using gendering. Yeah, because gendering is assigning a gender to, I, I think that yeah. the EM was just inadvertently put on. But that was yeah. in the paper.
there's another mistake that I'll do. Anyway, but you know, including refugees in the implementation or in design, as assuming that they're the, the study group that they have to do the interpreting. Anyway, so that's, that's the second term. So as you see, they're both about humanitarian technologies, one with staples, different regions, I really should train myself in stuff, and uh, the other about refugees. Okay. Thank you. Did I go